we're in Romans chapter 8 today. Romans chapter 8 begins, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the Spirit, but according to the flesh. It is really the pinnacle chapter, I think, of Romans. Because after he goes through how we're all guilty under sin in the first three chapters, whether you are uh, somebody who's far away from God and has absolutely no upbringing, whether you have some sort of a moral compass, or you are a religious Hebrew and you understand all of God's word, none of us measures up. None of us does what is good. There are none who are righteous. No, not one. There's not any with a poison of asps under our tongues. And all of that that he talks about and how he begins to talk about how in the flesh, I want to do the right thing, and yet I don't seem to have the strength to do it. The thing that I hate to do, that's what I practice. And the thing that I want to do, that's the thing that I don't do. So I know it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. He goes on and talks about this hopeless situation of human beings where our flesh is in control, where you are guided and ruled and a slave to your appetites. Most people go from one th desire to the next. What do you want to do now? I don't know. What do I want to watch on TV? I don't know. What do you want to eat for lunch? I don't know. Where do you, how do you want to spend our money? Where do you want this? Where do you want, 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 want? It's always about the next desire on our list. And you can be a slave to the flesh where you just do what you feel because you don't seem to have the power to do anything else. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Blessed be the Lord Jesus Christ because we are saved. So, Today I'm calling it not guilty. I'm going to go over eight small verses because it's a communion Sunday. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. As you know, we're going through Romans. We are in chapter 8, which is the end of the section I'm titling Sin and Sanctification, which we've gone over. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds in the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit, those things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So he basically continues his thought from chapter 7, speaking about a person who's completely lost to their sin and ruled by their flesh and saying, woe to me, what will I do? And what a wretched man I am. What a weighed down, burdened person I am because I hate myself, essentially. Praise be to the Lord Jesus Christ because he delivers us from that. This is one of my favorite verses in all of the scripture. There is therefore now. Therefore, because of all the things that we've talked about and that Jesus Christ has now come to be our savior, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And you'll notice the second half of this, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. It is word for word exactly what we find in verse four. And so 
We have a bit of an issue. If you do some research on this, you'll find that this second half of the verse is not included in the best manuscripts. It may have been a copyist helping along what Paul said and bringing verse 4, because it says the same thing in verse 4, so it's not wrong, but I think it's just duplicated up into verse 1. And the reason that it's important to understand that, well, if you look at the early church fathers, when they quote this passage, they don't quote the second half. And there's, trust me, I did the research. You could trust me. Because if you read this passage together with the second half, the way that it is, it seems as though there's a clause. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, but you better be walking by the Spirit where there is condemnation. You see, that's the implication of trying to help out God's word by bringing a verse and putting it out of context. But I think that's what's happened. So as we look at it, I'm going to address the first half of it as it is. What condemnation is, any of you know what condemnation is? Have you had a good dose of it today? You recommended daily allowance of condemnation? You're a bad person. You're wrong, evil, twisted, broken, beyond repair, hopelessly lost. That's condemnation. Do any of you recognize this? The taste in your mouth of ash? Yes. It's a declaration of evil, a, def a defamatory verdict, damnation, judgment rendered, punishment assigned, separation, none of which we have in Christ Jesus. And I, I talk all the time and I recycle things all the time, so please forgive me. But there is a thing called guilt, which is the number one reason for mental illness. And there's another thing called shame, which is the number one reason for suicide. They're very related. Guilt is when you feel guilty, that you've done something, some infraction, you've done something wrong. That's not condemnation. Condemnation is shame. Shame is the thing about you that will never be washed away. When you feel like you can't be good enough, you can't be smart enough. You're never reaching any particular level of contentment whatsoever, and therefore you condemn yourself, much like we saw in chapter 7. Condemnation. It's what the devil does when he gets on your shoulder and tells you you're not good enough, you're not smart enough, and fill in the blank with your own personal preference of condemnation. But there is, therefore, now no condemnation. There is no judgment. There is no angry God in heaven trying to burn you with his magnifying glass or waiting to drop a lightning bolt on you. There is not God who looks down and sees you make a mistake and he goes, oh, I can't believe it. Because you don't surprise him. He knows everything. That might be your earthly father, but it's not your heavenly father. There is therefore now no condemnation. There, God is not just waiting for one more mistake. Just blow it one more time and you're done. Any of you ever feel that way? I, f I felt that way several times today with all of these things going wrong. But there is no condemnation. For those who are in Christ Jesus, there is no verdict. There is no punishment. There is no purgatory. Yes, I said it out loud. There is no purgatory. That's you paying for your sins. That's you under condemnation saying, oh, I got to beat myself just, you know, just a few thousand years and then I'll be good enough to go to heaven. Nobody's good enough to go to heaven. Amen. Jesus wouldn't have had to come. Sorry, I get excited. There's no condemnation. The judgment against you, all of the judgment that should fall on you for your past sins, your present sins, and your future sins have been taken upon Jesus Christ up on the cross. You are truly free. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, if you don't know Christ Jesus, yeah, you're done. You're done. You're toast. Forget about it. There is a place for you. 
if you're in Christ Jesus, there's no condemnation. But if you're not in Christ Jesus, there's plenty of condemnation. You're going to have to stand before God. He's going to say, why should I let you into heaven? You say, well, I was a good person. And then he's going to pull out the list. <laughs> say, what about all this? Oh, I didn't think you knew about that. I thought you were a God of grace and forgiveness. and We weren't going to talk about that. Well, if you want to stand on your own merit, we have to talk about it. And there's only one way to deal with that. And it's called eternity separated from God. But that list was hung on the cross, Amen. your list, if you are in Christ Jesus. It's important to know the difference, and it's important to relish the difference, because I forget that sometimes, and the devil tells me how I'm worthless, and I have absolutely no right to stand here and talk to you and say anything, because guess what? I'm not perfect multiple times. There is no condemnation. Jesus in John 19, 30 said, it is finished. The, the original word is tetelestai, which means the debt is paid in full. Thank you, Lord. you ever have a mortgage burning party? I've never had the privilege. I'm still paying mine off. And I, I will into my older years. But, you know, you know, you burn the thing. That's it. The bank has no right over you anymore. They can't repossess your home because you didn't make a payment. It is finished. That's what Jesus said on the cross, to telestai, the debt is paid in full. If you are in Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation for you. There's no judgment for you. There's grace. Amen. There's no mistake that you can make that can make God forsake you. It's just one of those things that rolled through my mind yesterday. There is no mistake that you can make that can make God forsake you. He said, I will never leave you or forsake you. And I'm glad. And I'm glad he knew everything I was going to do before I did it. And it was hung on his own son, Jesus Christ. God came in the form of human flesh, took upon your sin and my sin, and died on the cross so that you wouldn't be condemned. Not just that you wouldn't be condemned ultimately before God, but that you won't be condemned now. In your mind, in your heart, as you listen to other people. I don't know about you, but I, you ever meet like very judgmental people? I hope you're not one of those people, but you know, people that are just critical about everything, can't ever seem to be happy about anything. They're not content in any way, shape or form at any given moment, no matter what. They could, they could win a $1,000 scratch off and say, oh, lost again. <laughs> but see, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Jesus took it all. He took it upon himself. And if you believe, it's simply for the asking, and it's simply for believing that Jesus Christ was sent for your sin and that he came to take away for your sin. And you submit your life to him and say, God, take my life. You made me for yourself, so take me for yourself. That's what it is to be in Christ Jesus. So, there's therefore now no condemnation. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says, For he, meaning God, made him, meaning Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. We have the opportunity to live a righteous life and tell the flesh where to go because of Jesus and because the Spirit of God then comes in and begins to rule and reign in our lives. And we're no longer a slave to our sin, although we volunteer from time to time. <laughs> Romans 8, 31 to 34, we're going to get to that, I'm hoping someday. <laughs> So what then shall we say of these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Listen, if God forgave you, who's going to hold something against you? Your friend, your neighbor, your relative, your, you know, somebody who can't forgive you, just can't forgive you for something you did. Really? Because God forgave me and punished his own son for what I did, and you can't forgive me? Sucks to be you. <laughs> because I'm not going to carry it. 
I'm going to bring it to the Lord, and I'm going to remember that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, if you do something wrong, you do something wrong, and you make it right, but you don't carry it. Amen. And certainly you shouldn't carry it for anyone else, especially if they have come to know Jesus Christ. So what are we going to say? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? It's too hard to believe. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? Well, since there's no condemnation, then nobody. It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died. And furthermore, he's been risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. So if you thought that his once and done sacrifice for all of your sins wasn't enough, he's still interceding for you on a regular basis. I don't know about you, but I need that. I need constant supervision and intercession. Hebrews 10, to 23 says, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. That's the condemnation. And our bodies washed with pure water. That's the symbol of the Holy Spirit. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. So we are to apply the blood of Jesus Christ to our life. We just shared communion. That's one of the ways that we apply the blood to our souls. We remember what Jesus Christ did and we accept it again all over again. It's kind of like redoing your marriage vows, if you will. Some of you are hoping for divorce or death. Okay. <laughs> you renew your marriage vows. Yeah, I know. I said that. Okay. <laughs> One of those days. <laughs> the reason I say that is because the scripture says that we were married to the law. We were married to the law which is you got to do, 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 and you never, ever, you never finish that list. And you should never do, you should never do, you should never do, you should never do, and you're, you fall into those things. But you're married to it, so you hope for death because there's no way of divorce from the law unless you're married to another Amen. and you yourself die. That's... That's what I had in my head, but it didn't come out that way. <laughs> For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free. All of you read this with me. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free. Hallelujah. I hope you can say that. And I hope you mean it, and I hope it's a reality in your life, because you're not a slave to your sin, you're free. You're free from what? The law of sin and death. I don't know if you remember this commercial. It was for Hebrew National. And the, and the, and the, the U.S. government says that we can put fillers in our hot dogs. We don't. The U.S. government says that we can use beef byproducts. We don't. The government says, you know, so it goes, we don't, because we answer to a higher authority, he says. You see, we answer to a higher authority, and it's the grace of Jesus Christ, because I am free from the law. I've been divorced from the law for I don't know how long. I've been free, Amen. free to marry another, and so I am the bride of Christ, as strange as that all sounds. Amen. So... A higher authority, because there are two spirits at work. There's two laws here, the law of the spirit of life and the law of sin and death. There are two laws. Everyone is born under one. Not everybody gets to go under the other. The law of the spirit of life says this. If I can figure out how to use this simple little gadget. <laughs> Condemnation. John 10.10, 10, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and destroy. Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it abundantly. He's talking about spiritual life. He's talking about communion with God. He's talking about love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, meekness, faithfulness, and self-control. He's talking about all of those things in our lives that we really desire, not the things in our flesh. 
the law of the spirit of life comes from Jesus. Psalm 91, great psalm, by the way, if you ever get down, feel depressed, beating yourself up under condemnation, good passage. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. This is God speaking. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. That is the law of the spirit of life. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is the law of the spirit of life. You have a savior, the Messiah, who came and died for your sins so that you might be forgiven and live free. Amen. The spirit of God sets us free, and if he sets you free, you're free indeed. And then there's the other law of sin and death. And you go, what's the law of sin and death? I don't think I ever read that anywhere. <laughs> Romans chapter 7, we just went through. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. And in the flesh, you are sold under sin. You were sold out. Adam, bombed out. It was the Adam bomb in Genesis. <laughs> sold under sin. He sold you out. For what I am doing, I do not understand, which means there's a complete lack of understanding as to why you're addicted. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. That's the law of sin. You're captive to it. You're a slave to it. You can't help yourself. The things you want to do, you don't do. And the things that you don't want to do, that's what you continually practice. That's the law of sin. And it's unavoidable. Every little human being, every little child is a sinner from birth. No amens on that. Amen. And they just get more complex as they grow up. That's the law of sin, is that you were born that way and you can't fix yourself. And it doesn't matter how many billions of dollars people spend on self-help books, your sin controls you until Jesus Christ fills you and sets you free. That's the law of sin and death. The law of death is found in Ezekiel 18.4 and verse 20. Be behold, my soul, all souls are mine. This is God speaking. The soul of the father as well as the soul of the son is mine. The soul who sins shall die. And then he says in verse 20, just in case you're wondering, you weren't sure. The soul who sins shall die. So the law of sin is you're one. And you can't be fixed. You need to die and be born again. The law of death is that you're a sinner and it's going to end in death. And you're going to have to give an account before God for the things that you do. The law of sin and death is you're broken, you can't fix yourself, and you're going to die because of sin and you're going to have to stand before God. That's the law of sin and death. Or the law of the spirit of life, which is you can cry out for forgiveness, accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, be born again, and have the Spirit of God set you free. Two laws. If I were a salesman, this would be the easiest sell in my whole life. If you were drowning and I threw you something and said, this will save you, wouldn't you put it on? Unless you said, no, I got this. <laughs> Three hours later, can I throw you a, a life preserver? No, I think I can hold out a little longer. The law of sin and death means you're a sinner and you're going to die. You can't swim, you will sink, and the sharks will eat you. You need Jesus. So, two laws. Verse 3, for what the law, this is the, the law of Moses or God's expressed will, and he tells us, and it's good and it's right, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Notice he wasn't in sinful flesh. He came in the likeness of sinful flesh. He looked like you and me, but he wasn't a sinner. That's why the virgin birth. On account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled 
in us. Notice that the righteous requirements of the law are not fulfilled by us. They're fulfilled in us. Who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So here comes God's law. Can you imagine being the people of Israel, being out of slavery and going out into the wilderness and finally being free and having all of the trouble behind you and you come before Mount Sinai and it's on fire and there's clouds and there's lightning and there's shaking, there's an earthquake and the people go, I don't want to go talk to God. I got some things I got to deal with. Moses, why don't you go? Why don't you go and then tell us what he says? That's what he does. And he comes down with Ten Commandments and they're in the middle of a wild orgy. He loses his temper and breaks the commandments. All of them, physically. The law came and we couldn't keep it. The law came, if you just take the Ten Commandments, for instance, and you can't do it. You can't have any other God before God. I mean, you can't put other things before God. My goodness, you get out of bed and you go, ah, my back hurts today. I don't think I'm going to church. I'm just trying to be honest. I said that. It's a beautiful day outside, but I have to stay here and do the message. <laughs> you don't think I struggle with things. You're funny. <laughs> the law comes. And we don't measure up to it. What the law could not do, God did by sending his own son. Because, see, the law doesn't make you right. Just because you know the law, just because you could recite the law, just because you haven't memorized 1 through 10, doesn't mean you do it, right? Good. But he did by sending his own son that Jesus showed us how to live the life and how to be obedient. 1 John 4, 9 says, In this, the love of God was manifest toward us, that God has sent his only begotten son into the world, that we might live through him. Jesus came to break the law in the way that it no longer has power over you in condemnation. He fulfilled the law, and he gives you that fulfillment, so that the righteous life that he would have us live, we could finally live. We have the ability to now. 2 Corinthians 5.15 says, And he died for all that those who live should live no longer for themselves. If you're a Christian, you don't live for yourself anymore. Did you know that? You're dead to yourself. But for him who died for them and rose again. See, that's the exchange. I accept the life of Jesus Christ into my life. I die to myself. That's the great exchange that we make with him. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. Well, that makes just so much sense. If you live your life according to the flesh, it's largely your desires, your imagination, your wants. I don't know, what do I want to wear today? What do I feel like? I don't know. What do you want to have for lunch? I don't know. You want something to drink? I don't know. Does anything hurt anywhere? Yeah, okay. You, you need to get some pills or something. It's constantly listening to and being obedient to your every whim and desire. And guess what? That leads to death. And you'll never be happy. Oh, I got a brand new car yesterday. Did I tell you? I got a brand new car. It's beautiful and shiny. And then I drove it off the lot. And it's suddenly worth measurably less. And I parked it way out in the parking lot of ShopRite. And some idiot left a cart, right? And it hit my car. If you live according to the flesh and you're going to try to gratify every desire of your flesh, you will be disappointed constantly. Because you'll never be happy if you're looking for your every possible whim to be satisfied because you can't, and even when you do, it's not what I pictured. <laughs> That's what it is to live according to the flesh. All I need is just a little bit more money, just a, just a raise, just a little more. And then you get the raise and you're like, oh, that ain't so much. 
I mean, I mean, I need a lot more. Okay, let's say you just came into a lot of money and you go, wow, that's, that's, that's going to be gone in a week. <laughs> if you try to live your life according to the flesh, your own desires and your own appetites, you will be sadly disappointed all of your life. And there are people that walk around that have incredibly more than you and I who are still not satisfied with what they have. Why is it that rich people, rock stars, um, basketball players, football players, these guys get involved in the, the seediest drugs, sex, violence? Why? Because what they have is not enough because they live according to the flesh. If you live according to the flesh, you will die. And you'll walk around constantly unsatisfied. I'm sorry, I've gotten off my slide. This is an animal. This is a person. Any questions? This is why people think that we came from apes. Because you look at apes, and all they think about is eating, pooping, urinating on you if they can, and procreation. Wow, that's a lot like me. That's how I live my life. My life is all about me, and it's all about what I want, myself. I live just like that monkey. No wonder you think you came from him, because you're living like an animal according to the flesh. No, that's not my picture before I was saved, but I was much like that. So... The natural man, the human being from birth, this is what we're born into in our sinful nature. You are a mini triune like the God that we serve and love. You are body, soul, and spirit, okay? When you are born, you have a body and you have a soul which encompasses your thoughts, your emotions, your desires, okay? And your spirit is not in tune with God. You are not alive. God constantly knocks on your door and says, hello, hello, through your conscience. And if you don't respond, he'll leave you alone. But what happens when you become born again is you get a spirit from God and the spirit of God lives inside of you. The question is, is your body going to control your soul or is your spirit going to control your soul? Your soul is what you think about. Does the Spirit of God control what you think about? Does he control your appetites? Does he control your imagination? That's what it is to be ruled by the Spirit. Is the Spirit of God is the one that controls my soul, my mind, my heart, and even my body comes into compliance because the Spirit's on top. My soul is the one that makes a decision all the time, but without the Spirit of God and without living according to the Spirit, you have the body in control. And the body tells you what you're going to do and where you're going to go and whether somebody's going to get a smack because they deserve it. Your body's in control, and you give that over to them. To, to, people give themselves over to their body. So you can live like an animal or you can live like somebody who's been born again and has the Spirit of God inside of them. You're either led by the Spirit or you're led by the flesh. Now, I'm here to give you the sad news that on occasion, people who have the Spirit of God and have been born again live in the flesh. It will be the most miserable life that you could live because your body will never be happy. You will never be satisfied because you don't have fellowship with God. And you've been ruined for this world. When I first became a Christian, I still did a lot of stupid things. And those stupid things didn't bring me joy anymore. And I was mad at God. He was a party pooper. He pooped on my party. <laughs> Getting high didn't make me high anymore. It made me stupid and lethargic and I had to wait for it to wear off. Doing speed just made me scatterbrained doing all of those things that I still did. And, I, and you know what? I didn't know any better, and I was still doing stupid things, ultra stupid things. I still do stupid things, but those were ultra stupid things. Then the Spirit of God led me to a Bible study where I started reading the Word of God, and I started understanding, and I had fellowship, and I understood the Word of God, and I, and I blossomed because I was not the same old person that I once was. 
I pray that you have that experience because you're no longer an animal. You're now a child of God, ruled by the spirit, not the flesh. Amen. For the car carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. To be carnally minded, it doesn't mean that you order meat on the Italian menu. Carne on the Italian menu is meat, okay? And it's, it's aptly used here. Meat. Uh, my buddy Dino's nodding and said, yeah, carne. <laughs> For to be carnally minded is death. If you've got your mind on the flesh, if you have it upon your desires and how you feel today, whether you're going to go outside or not go outside or see somebody or do something that you know God would have you do, but I, I don't know, I don't feel comfortable. <laughs> you're ruled by the flesh. Oh, but my hair looks terrible. You know, I didn't even comb my hair today. I realized it when I went in the bathroom, washed my hands and went, dude, you didn't even comb your hair. And I said, there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And I walked on. Because my body doesn't rule me and, you know, God sees me naked anyway and he's okay. To be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Boys and girls, this is a matter of life or death. It is death to be carnally minded. And what that leads to is everything in Galatians 5, 19 to 21. Drunkenness, envy, dis dissensions, outbursts of wrath, contention, sorcery, l licentiousness. That looks like a you. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, adultery. I idolatry, hatred, jealousies, selfish ambitions, heresies, murders, and revelries. All of these things come out of a sinful heart. And if you're given over to these things without being born again, then you are lost. Your brain is stuck and you can't get out. You have no choice. You're a slave to sin like that baboon. On the other hand, to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Good news you don't have to live that way, ruled by the flesh. Your body doesn't have to tell you what to do. Your imagination doesn't need to send you down the road to hell. You can be redeemed by the Spirit of God if you die to yourself and live to him. If you're in Christ Jesus, then there's no condemnation. And then you can have the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, patience, peace, patience. <laughs> patience. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those are the things that will naturally come out of somebody who's been born again. It won't be something that you have to like force to do. It's one of those things that will come naturally as you grow in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the fruit that grows in a believer's life. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. Fight the power. That's what it is. It's rebellion against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it be. That's a really scary statement. People cannot submit themselves to God who have not submitted themselves to God. And they are a slave to their feelings. They're a slave to their feelings. So when you see riots in the street and cars overturned and people beating up one another, don't think it's strange they can't do any better than that. You can't rehabilitate a heart. Only God can. Don't be surprised when police are killed. Don't be surprised when places are looted. Don't be surprised when you see the worst of flesh on display on the TV for political gain. Don't be surprised. They can't help it. That's like... A monkey, you know, doing something disgusting in public. They, they're a monkey. They cannot submit themselves to the law of God. Rebellion is one of those things that comes with the sinful nature. And even though the Lord comes and he makes us born again, we still will be trying to undo the software package that we've been given, still trying to undo the programming. That's why I need constant reboots with, with the Lord. And of course, there's nobody who does rebellion like Bart Simpson. Standing under a no loitering sign. That's, 
That's right. That's right. No loitering. I'm loitering. I even got a friend here that's going to loiter with me. He's the picture of absolute rebellion and loved by so many because if it's wrong, that's what he wants to do. He's the picture of every human being, and that's why everybody kind of identifies with him. Not subject to the law of God, nor can they be. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. If somebody doesn't know the Lord Jesus Christ in a relational fashion, if they haven't received the Spirit of God, don't expect them to do well because they are morally bankrupt. Spiritually, they're homeless. They have no ability to get up and go and do anything on their own. They don't have the financial backing to do so. Uh, they, don't, they don't have the clothes to go on an interview. They don't, you know, spiritually speaking, don't require everyone who happens to be in your space to clean up. They can't. That's like, I, I, I spent the other day helping a neighbor move. And every other word was... It, it was, yeah, it began with a letter F and, and a, a couple S's and some other, you know, there's a, and it was every other word. And it was like, and he, he has no problem speaking that way in front of my grandchildren. He can't help being a sinner. Am I going to require everybody around me to clean up when they have no capability of obeying the law of God? Shouldn't I be concerned for their soul when I hear that kind of thing instead of being grieved about their words? The answer is yes. And so I had to wrestle with all that, and then I finally said, I need to just love this guy in the midst of his foulness because he needs Jesus. And that's the cure, not cleaning up your, your language. So... Moral bankruptcy. Jesus said this in John chapter 3. Jesus answered and said to this guy, Nicodemus, he came to him at night, said, we know that you're a teacher that's come from God because nobody could do the miracles that you do unless he were from God. And Jesus said to him, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water, by the way, that's natural birth, and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, that's natural birth, and that which is born of spirit, capital S, the spirit of God, is spirit. Don't marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. Don't get shaken up by the term and by the way, it was Jesus' term long before it was the born-again Christian's term. Are you one of them born-again Christians? I didn't know there was any other kind. <laughs> what do you mean? And Jesus said, you have to be born again or you won't see the kingdom of God. Is there another kind of Christian? Well, I'm kind of a Christian, but I'm not born again. Well, Jesus said you need to be born again. It's right here. It's not my term. I'm pulling it from the Scripture. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes. You hear the sound of it, but you can't tell where it's come from or where it goes. It's, he's saying like the wind, the spirit of God comes in a way that you can't see and you can't quite nail down, just like the wind. You can't see the wind, but you can see what the wind does. You can see the leaves blow. You can see, you know, all of that, but you can't see the wind. God's like that. He's unseen, but you'll see the reactions of what he does. So is everyone who was born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said to him, how can these things be? You get the idea he was completely unaware of this. And Jesus answered and said to him, are you the teacher of Israel and you do not know these things? Jesus said, you don't have a relationship with your heavenly father. You have a relationship with the law. Do you know what that means? You fail. You die. That's the law <laughs> of death, right? You die because you're a soul that sins. And the law of sin means you're a slave to it. And without a relationship, you've got no hope of overcoming it. And then he says in John 3, 14 to 16, and Mo as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the son of man be lifted up that whoever believes in him should not perish, 
but have everlasting life. Moses lifted up this bronze serpent. Bronze is always a picture of sin because it's mixed metal. And made this serpent. And if they looked to the serpent, they were saved from the bites of the vipers. Jesus says, I'm like a snake. I'm like a dirty bronze snake up on a pole. That's what he was. He who knew no sin became sin for us. That by that we might become the righteousness of God. And he says, even as they looked to the serpent in the wilderness, and so they were saved from the bites and didn't die, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, and he was lifted up on a pole. He was lifted up on a cross. And then he says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And yes, it's exclusive. Jesus made it exclusive. God says there's one way to come to me, and it's through faith in the finished work of my son. Amen? Amen. That was me trying to keep it short, because it's Communion Sunday. We've gotten through eight verses. I hope you guys are blessed and you remember that there is now, therefore, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If you are in Christ Jesus... There's no condemnation for you because it went on his son. If it didn't go on his son, then you have to stand before God on your own. But if you're in Christ Jesus, there's no condemnation. So don't let anybody be unforgiving and nasty toward you and have it bother you. Because if God forgave you, who's going to hold things against you? And who, what does it matter if God forgave you? I mean, certainly we have an obligation to do what's right and to change, confess our sins because he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from unrighteousness. That's the law of the spirit of life. But don't give way to fear. God is not a God of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. Don't give way to depression, which is the most selfish thing you could ever do. Don't give way to anger. Don't give way to any of those things. And all of that is rooted in a shame that's not been dealt with. If you haven't dealt with it today, leave it with the Lord. Leave your shame, leave your guilt, leave the past with him and accept the grace that comes from Jesus Christ and you will be living a spirit-led life. Yes. Amen?